Thank you. All right, let's get going here. Uh, we got Jeff online with us. And you guys are here. So today we're going to be going over contracts, writing a purchase agreement. Um, you have to give me. I am taking the migraine right now, so Ooh. I lose focus. No, I've had coffee. No, I've had coffee. Like that. Other other things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to get started, obviously, uh, we're just going to start with. I'll just pick a listing, uh, one of our office ones on MLS. Uh, we will go with Huntington Cove. Yeah, I showed that property. I wonder why no one is buying. I know it's going up with them. I know. They will, they will soon enough. They need to drop it about 10000 Oh, that's good. Yeah. We need to tie by 10000 like, yeah. yeah. So one of the biggest things, obviously, we have our MLS. We, you know, search the property. Client wants to write an offer. Um, a couple things here. We always want to make sure we ta check the tax record. Oh, that's uh, one where we did the open house. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just to kind of see what's going on, gives us information. We can verify the square footage and different things in there. Um, building square feet. Um, things like that. Lot size. Um, different things like that. Um, another thing we always like to do is. Um, From the main display, the listing, we always kind of want to check the recorder's office. And we have links here. Uh, if you hover over them, they tell you which one they are. So, Clark County Recorder, my recorder. So, it's just a good idea uh, to make sure there's no clean, you know, the house is in default. There aren't liens against it, kind of gives us an idea of what we're going up against. Oh, they'll show up there. Uh -huh. This is going to have to copy the post number. Because you guys want to search for a parcel number. And go ahead and paste it in here. Not a robot. Search. So now after you click search, it's going to look like nothing happened, but you just have to scroll down and give you the results. Hmm. <laughs> so this kind of the latest thing is always going to be whatever was last is going to be at the top. So in this case, they just did a homestead common thing. Um, homestead? A homestead is kind of like, uh, I forget what the limit is in Nevada. I believe it's 450,000. But essentially, if you're being sued, a homestead protects them from going after your house. It's basically an insurance policy, per se, to protect your home from being sued on that. I try to see. Um, yeah, but it's just like, if, even if you have an LLC, you just, when you homestead it, if someone sues you, they can't take it. They can't take it. So if your house they is worth under that amount, if your house is worth over that amount, they can sue you above that. You force you to sell it, but you're still protected to that amount. So, is that link against um, HOAs? Um, HOAs are still liens. So, I'm not sure exactly how it does because those laws keep changing right. with it. So, it's hard to it's hard to keep up with. It. But one of the nice features here is obviously transaction desk is willing to work in front of offer. But if you are writing an offer, you can use the shortcut right here to go right to transaction desk and create a new transaction. So you don't have to go to transaction desk first, type in the MLS number or anything like that. You can just click right here and automatically open transaction desk. And it's gonna create a new transaction. Now for me, when you're creating a transaction, I always start for me personally, I like to start with the client's last name and then maybe dash the address. Um, that way,
that way it's easy to find. If you just type in the address and um, you guys call us and say, I need help writing this offer, it makes it hard for us to find it. So if we have the address and the last name, because we can log in as management into your transaction desk, we can basically, we can basically um, mirror you or, in, you know, basically gives the opportunity for us to pretend that we're you. Like so we, a remote access. Sort of. Yeah. 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 Because I can log in as under Kevin and then basically pretend to be you in transaction. Gotcha. So I can help you. We can help you write offers and check over stuff or whatever. Um, it just makes it easy to do that. Um, under templates, we have a buyer's template and a listing template. So everyone has access to this. Um, the reason you want to choose the templates is because it pretty much pulls all the forms you're going to need for the transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't pull every form, like we don't include all the short sale forms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, counter offers or addendums. Um, you can always add those, but just basically to get going, um, it gives you the basics of what you're going to need for a transaction. Go ahead and click create. And it's going to bring you into the transaction wizard. <coughs> Um, for the most part, I just, I just click next here because uh, I already pulled the data. I click next. You just want to get to the context portion of it. Now, for some reason, <coughs> I don't know why it does this, but it'll put in two selling brokers for S&G Realty. I just delete the bottom one. Um, it puts us in there twice. Um, you'll still see us twice because Obviously, this is our listing, so but normally just the SMG Realty and then the other agency. Now, at this point, we don't actually have the buyer in here yet. So we can always go up to add, to add a buyer. So we can either create a new um, transaction contact if you haven't put your buyer into transaction desk yet. If they're in matrix, they don't automatically pull into here. So you have to add them. Um, at this point, I'm just going to pick an existing contact. Um, let's go with uh, hello, George. Uh, first name, last name, you want to make sure their email's in there. Um, as far as legal name, so if the buyer is George, but it's an LLC, this is where you can type in their legal name and it's George Hill and kind of LLC or George Hill and Trust, whatever it may be. Their preferred signature can be initials GH. If you type in a signature, you have to put in initials or one I just don't know if you want to do it so it shows up correctly when you sign. Because um, a lot of times you get an LLC and you need the LLC to show in the name, but their signature, they're actually signed the name as trustee. So Preferred signature can be, so the legal name can be George Allen, and then preferred signature can be George Allen, comma, TRS, or LLC, or whatever their LLC is. So just go ahead and click save. And then at this point, I just save and exit. So when you're working in transaction desk, we'll go back to the dashboard here. Just don't go into forms and start typing on documents or forms, I always make sure you go to your transaction. So you always wanna be working within your transaction in transaction desk. So once you click on it, you'll see transaction dashboard. And in this case, we have a picture of the house and what we named it. So in here we'll have forms in this section here. And then we'll have documents, checklists. You can kind of change these around however you want it to look. But essentially what we do is we're gonna to go to forms. And then obviously we always start with the duties owed. Um, in this case, we aren't gonna go over all that, but we're just gonna go straight into the purchase agreement. It's very slow today. Now just so you know, if you need to switch between forms, once you're in, the form section. You can move between forms without getting out of this. So you can edit all of your forms. So if you want to go do another one, do you know the 
request for repairs or disclosure guide, broker's compensation, whatever it may be, you can just switch in, in between those. Now for me, uh, let me see if I can just do this much easier to see. For me, I think the purchase agreement's kind of the key to everything um, in transactions, whether you're working with a listing or you're working with a buyer. Because if you have a listing, eventually you're gonna see a purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand it because that's gonna determine who pays what, what they're getting and all that kind of stuff for your net sheets. So kind of understanding the purchase agreement, I think is kind of a key to the main thing in, in, you know, in, in anything, in any transaction, no matter what, you're gonna end up dealing with a purchase agreement. So um, we never wanna have blanks. You always wanna make sure um, the information in there is correct. Um, I always, you know, put the date. Uh, if you're gonna, if your client's gonna sign it tomorrow, which is the date that they sign. Yeah. So I would. So if my client's gonna sign this tomorrow, I would move this date over till tomorrow. Yeah. Morning, Jason. I don't know if you guys can all see that. So. Um, I always make sure you have the right address. Um, there are glitches in transaction desk. Sometimes it'll like pull half of our company address in there. So you just okay. want to check. Like all of a sudden you see like 4975 Huntington, Huntington Road 105. You're like, wait a minute. It's like half of SMG's address and half of property address. Um, also like Las Vegas is a code in here. So next after you do the date, we're gonna put the purchase price in here. This one I'm just gonna offer for 100,000. Just type in like that. You'll see it fills in down here to make sure that's correct. You can tab over. And then is the buyer going to occupy or not occupy the address? So this is huge because if they're doing an FHA loan um, and they clicked it does not intend, well, there's an issue there. Is FHA, do you need to occupy the property? Yeah. So VA, you know, certain things like that. See, I always want to make sure you're, you know, whether, you know, what, what, what your clients do. Is it an investment property? They tend to live in. So. so the first page is kind of basically what we're offering and how we're structuring the deal. So in this case, let's, if we take a look at the listing, we're looking that they want 3,000 earnest money down. Um, just because they ask for three thousand, that doesn't mean we have to give them. That's just what they're asking for. Um, this is where it comes into how strong is your offer going to be. If you're in competition, you may go up to five thousand, yeah. showing, "Hey, I'm looking to put a little more into the game." That that's going to make your offer look a little more appealing. Mm -hmm. um, so those are different things you can do. If you go in and put a thousand, well, they're going to be like, "Well." You're not really risking as much, so you see that sometimes. Um, but that's where communication comes in uh, with the other agent. Once you write it up and get it signed, you know, I'd call the other agent. Hey, look, I noticed that there's only a thousand being be in there because we're doing a VA loan. You know, because they may not pick up on that just because you put it in there and they're doing a VA loan. They may not be thinking that. Yeah. So a lot of times it, it helps to call and explain. Um, that's always, you know, communication. And when you, and when you call the other side, Mm -hmm. Hey, great listing. The clients love it. Hey, congratulations on that. So, you know, I just sent over an offer to you. Start out with congratulating. Open up that line of communication. You know, let them know, hey, great job. Mm -hmm. um, that's, they're going to be like, you know, you're, you're stroking their ego. You know, at the end of the day, you're stroking their ego, and that's a good thing. Um, it shows you want to work with them. Um, and it, it really does make a difference. Uh, you communicate with them as opposed to you just send something over. Like you. <laughs> what am I going to communicate with him about that offer? Uh, if anything, like, hey, just check your email, just send it over. Hey, great job. You know, client is interested, you know, just take a look at it. Let me know, if, you know, let me know. Um, it all just depends. <laughs> So in this case, we're just going to do the 3000 In most cases, we're just going to put um, to be wired, because pretty much everything's to be wired these days. Now, I definitely don't want blanks in here. So deposited within one business day from acceptance to offer as defined 
or generally do like two to three days to go wire. Is that standard? Um, or is that just like pretty, standard? pretty much. I mean, you want to get it in there quick. Um, and the big thing about earnest money is, is if you write an offer and it's accepted, your client needs, to, even That's if they want to cancel, they need to put that earnest money in. Okay. Because if you don't, you're in breach of contract. They're not putting your earnest money in. Um, sometimes you can talk to the other agent and be like, hey, they had a change of mind. You just want to, you know, cancel this. Is that all right with you guys? But if you don't communicate with them and don't do it, um, your client can be sued. <laughs> and our office actually had a client sue someone that didn't put earnest money in on a piece of land. And that buyer lost and had to pay that guy 10 grand. Oh, damn. Because he was in breach of contract because they didn't deposit their earnest money, kept fighting it, didn't do it. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? You breached your contract. Due diligence at that point means nothing. Well, because you breached the contract by not putting so it in. Yeah, he, the court ruled in favor of the seller because the buyer breached his contract by not depositing the earnest money, and therefore the property had been off the market for a few days. Oh, so you know it, it can happen. Um, obviously here in Nevada, it's always escrow. Um, we don't put we don't put EMD into trust accounts. We don't do it with a seller's broker. It's escrow holder always in, in the back. Additional deposit. So if you were going to do an additional deposit, whether it's EMD, we don't see it too much, but sometimes you might be like, hey, we're going to put in 3000 right now, but in a week, we're going to put in another. Um, if you make it part of the earnest money, then that kind of protects it. Um, but if we're not going to do that, which is most cases, I always put in zeros. I don't like blanks in contracts. Um, just, just not my thing. So now we're looking at, okay, item C. This agreement is contingent upon the buyer qualifying for a new loan. So in this case, we're going to do, let's just do FHA. And I always make sure you look at the boxes, where the boxes start to make sure you're checking the right one. Yeah, right. Because if you check VA, you know, maybe that. So let's just say, in this case, we're putting uh, FHA 3.5% down. Um, what's that, 400? Yeah. Um, so we're going to put... Uh, or, uh, so, um, yeah. Three eighty six. So at this point, we're financing $386,000. We are not assuming the loan. I get a lot of people that type in box D. We are not assuming loans. Most loans aren't assumable. We're not doing a promissory note. That might a promissory note might be in a case where it's uh, owner will carry. That's where you use a promissory okay. note. Just an example. When? Promissory note. Or uh, owner owner will carry. I do just because I'm dealing with monetary units here. Okay. I'm just and OCD so, about that. Okay. So we have our balance of purchase price. So what we get here is if the way this sheet works is we have actually it's not fourteen thousand. I'm actually wrong there. It's eleven thousand. Because we have our total purchase price here. So lines A through F equal G. Kind of like your taxes, when you do your taxes, they add up that same way. So we have 386 plus the earnest money, because the earnest money goes towards that purchase. And that gives us a balance of $11,000. Okay, so A through G. A through F, F equal G. F equals. Yeah. So if you have the 11, the 386, and 3,000, that should equal 400000 for our purchase price. So does anyone have any uh, questions on this first page here? OK. So section two here is going to be new loan application. So if you are doing financing, a lot of times you'll see like NA or done. I always just put three days. 
So basically what this is, is most of the time you have a pre-approval letter you get from the lender. It's like, okay, I got a pre-approval letter. They can buy it for this amount of money. Mm -hmm. What this is saying here is your buyer is actually going to fill out and complete the actual loan application. Just that pre-approval letter, you gave some generic numbers to your lender. They're actually going to start the loan process. They're, they're applying for the loan now. So they need to contact their lender within three days to basically start the process. That they're going through, here's our offer, it's accepted. I'm supplying the lender, stuff like that. So I usually just give them a couple of days because you never know. And this is business days. So obviously weekends yeah. don't count, you know, weekends are holidays. And that's basically what it is. Um, if it's a cash deal, NA, because they're not doing a loan. Appraisal contingency. And this is where a lot of things, these numbers start playing around on where you can do, if you're doing a cash offer and not doing an appraisal, it'd be NA or zero. If they're not doing one, um, generally we go 14 days for a conventional or FHA. If it's a VA, generally 21 days. Right. Uh, the reason why is VA appraisals take a little bit longer. Um, I believe there's actually only, from what I've heard, <coughs> there's actually only two qualified VA appraisers in Las Vegas Valley. Yeah, so the fact that there's not 30 appraisers to go out and do appraisals, you have two guys that are qualified to do VA appraisals. So their time is pretty busy, so we do 21. Um, it's just to make sure. And that was for VA. Yeah. For VA, okay. yeah. Loan contingency. We, on average, we go 21 days. Um, you'll see some people do less. You'll see a lot of people try to do 30. You'll see appraisal at 25 days and loan contingency 30 days. Well, that's affecting how strong your offer is. Because now you're waiting as, as the seller. Now I'm waiting. And now I have to wait for 25 days to find out if this house appraises. Oh, God. And if it doesn't, I, they may, I may not want to come down to that price and I'm going to put my house back on the market. So for me, I would tighten that up as a selling agent, be like, back it up to 14. I, I want to know, does this house appraise and we're moving forward or I'm not putting it back on the market? So you got to kind of look at both sides of it as of how you're doing it. When you're writing an offer, you're kind of thinking of both sides. Obviously, if you're representing the buyer, you're trying to do the buyer's best interest, mm -hmm. but it also makes your offer possibly stronger. Uh, same thing with low contingency. I don't want to wait 30 days on the 30-day escrow. Um, as a seller, as a buyer, okay, yeah, if you can knock that out. But once again, my internet connection is unstable. I don't know. All right. <laughs> um, in this case, oops. I try not to leave blanks in here. Um, so this isn't a cash purchase, so it's not a brokerable. Um, yeah. Um, I would normally, I would normally put like two days. In, in this case, normally what you would, because if you're sending over an offer, if you're representing the buyer, <coughs> before you send the offer, you want proof of funds. Like to me, because I don't want to look yeah. like an idiot saying, Hey, I sent over this offer and oh, sorry, my buyer only has you know 50 bucks in his account. Oh, we just put in a four hundred thousand dollar cash offer. Sorry about that. I didn't do my job. Because you have to remember, as realtors, we're responsible for our due diligence too. Yeah. Just because the buyer has due diligence, we're responsible in that portion too to do due diligence as well. We're here to protect our buyer. If you don't do something, if you don't recommend things, and that's why we have disclosures, um, you can be held accountable. If you, you know, if someone doesn't want to get a home inspection, we make them sign a couple different places that you don't want a home inspection. And we send text or email, hey, you sure you don't want a home inspection? You know, we never know things we can't see because that protects us. And there was a case uh, in New York where a buyer didn't want a home inspection. And about two months later, stuff started happening in the house and they filed a lawsuit attorney 
I'll send delivered paperwork with a lawsuit to the agent and the broker. So the agent, the broker, opened up their email, showed this in the form, signed that you don't want it, showed all the emails. Hey, will you recommend one? Are you sure? Please respond. No, 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 we don't want one. And it back over the attorney. Attorney's like, I'm not taking this case in Canada. But that's where you protect yourself. That's where we write things down. I know a lot of people, and I watch the show too, Million Dollar List. Mm -hmm. What they don't show you in those shows, they don't show you the attorney side in New York. In New York, attorneys write the contracts. Yeah. Here, we do. we're responsible yeah. for everything. That's why they can negotiate over the phone and say, okay, do we take this? Do we take this? Counter. No, we don't counter over the phone. Right. 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 <laughs> right. We don't counter over the phone. We don't do addendums over the phone. We write things down. When you have a question about your buyer, do you want this or that? Get it in text. Get it in writing. You know, you know, in, in an email, we, we want a paper trail. So that way we know we presented that to the buyer, they responded. You just have a phone call about it. Hey, do you want a home warranty? No, I don't. Okay, well then you go do it. You don't own a home warranty. And they're like, well, I thought I had a home warranty. Well, it's like you said, no. When did I say no? Yeah. When you were doing Well, I had the email right here that says you said no. I just asked you if you wanted it. So just, I mean. Yeah, if you do have a call. Follow up with an email confirming. Yes. You know, for our conversation, you said that you didn't want to call. So at least you got to tell. Right. Yeah. It's it's just better to get things in writing to protect yourself. You know. Um. Sale of the sale of, uh, of other property. Is this purchase agreement contingent upon the sale of their house selling? Mr. Singh. Right. It's going to be a yes or no. If it's a yes, then you are going to need a contingent upon sale addendum. It says it right here. The attached contingent upon sale addendum is incorporated in this, into this agreement. So if you forget to include that and you check this box, you have no reason because it just told you to include it. Why you look at me like that? <laughs> because you're looking like I just messed up like I already did this. <laughs> No, I'm looking like well, if that's the shit I would do. Right. <laughs> and, and that's why and that's why I always say be careful. Like when I do trainings and stuff and I ask you to write a contract, I'm gonna ask you to fill it out to the best of your ability first. Because I want to see what you're reading and what you're comprehending. Mm -hmm. From there it can help you out right. and go from there. Right. But I want you know, I wanna see because in most cases, <laughs> like I said, it tells you right there. If checked. You're going to need something else. What, um, um, what is the addendum look like? Like, what do you put in it? The condition upon sale. Yeah. Um, it basically just says the house is either list, currently listed or it's not listed yet. If it is listed, it's listed with this escrow. You know, it's listed <laughs> for sale. If this, this is the MLS number. If it's under contract, then you fill in the escrow contract information, estimated close date. Is this where you put in like if you're going to buy the furniture in the house? Is that where you put in there? No, no, no. That this is contingent upon sale addendum is only so if you need to forward. sell your house to buy the okay, house right off. Right. So if the house is not listed yet, you put in what? How does the house make, is not currently listed? Does that make you feel bad? Like this, that most likely not gonna like accept that house. Well, it's tough for to get accepted. Yes. But in there, you also have a date saying, like, look, if we don't get our house sold by this date and we don't cancel this purchase agreement by this date, then we waive that contingency and then therefore must continue to buy this house, even though our house didn't sell. Oh, God. Okay. So, oh, so they stuck in the middle? Or you, well, you it depends on what date you put in there. So you have to be careful and think about, like, well, hey, I want 30 days to sell. When's my close date on this? When do my contingencies run out? So hold on, so you have to buy it no matter what if you cannot sell your home? If you do not cancel prior to the date you put in oh, the addendum. I see what you said. So what's usually the date? 30 days, you said? It it really depends. If you your house 60 is in 60 days, 90 days? Well, you put 90 days and you're doing a 30 day close here. How does that make sense? Well, you tell me. That's what I'm asking. Well, no. Because I'm the rookie here. Well, no, no, I'm just saying if you're supposed to close this house in 30 days. Right. Why would you put 90 days on okay, your other? So one? I have to change it you'd on make, the you'd, beginning. You'd make it 25 days on your addendum because this is supposed to close in 30. 
So you need to cancel prior to that. Five days. Wow. So how will I do it? Will it be seen that then? Does that mean how how soon will the house sell? The, the house is done. Sell you don't you don't know, but you need to. All you need to do is make sure you cancel prior to that expiration date. So, so, so. Isn't it easier if you sell your home first up on contingency once you find a new home? Wouldn't that be easier? Because it's quicker to find a new to a home to buy than to sell your home, right? Not necessarily. You know? Well, and then, if you and then, then what happens if you sell your home and people want to move in? Where are you going to live? Yeah. You, have no place to go. Can you, do like a rent back? you can do a rent back, but if the buyers don't want to yeah. do a rent back, you know, the, those are all things that become the negotiable and what the situations are. So you cannot cancel like the other way around, say like, okay, I sold you this home, but if I cannot find any six months to find a home, <laughs> is that too much? And if I don't find a home in six months, then I'm not going to tell you that? Yeah. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, the longest I've ever seen. I just want to know. Two months. Hmm. I've got a two month rent back on right now in my niece's house. Yeah. You know, they have November till November 15th. Luckily, we should get the keys on the 13th of November, so we're kind of close. Uh, so, I mean, oh my it's God. not going to be quicker. Like, somebody submits an offer, and you, um, and then in counter, you would say, um, we'll accept your offer, but only if you um, agree to two months of rent back while we sell our home. Yeah, and normally what I did, like in my case, I put in the agent agent remarks on the listing. Seller may seller will need a lease back until oh, the end oh. of the end of October, possibly into November. Okay. So that way, when the agents are writing my offers to me, they know to include a post occupancy addendum or terms on that. Perfect. Or if they're writing an offer, I'll be like, hey, we need something about. This. You know, we, we need to know because that's part that needs to be part of this deal. Okay. So, and the reason we can only go to November 15th is because we closed on <coughs> September 15th and it was an FHA offer. Uh, FHA, they got to be within, they have to be within in the house within 60 days. Right. Now, the FHA police aren't going to come around and check and be like, did you move in? It's midnight, 12 or 1 a.m. Who are you? You know, but that's as true. far as on paper, we have to have that. Uh, so, so now we go to fixtures and personal property. So in this section is anything that's fixed to the house that is not excluded even on the MLS. So if you put washer dryer not included, this not included, that not included. That's for the furniture people. Right, now normally furniture, if you're going to do that, you can say it's included in the sale okay. or you negotiate the furniture on a separate outside of escrow. Okay. So if you want to buy couches and stuff, you guys make your own basically invoice. Look, I'm going to buy your furniture for this. You guys make the own payment and all that. It doesn't go through escrow. Is that, is that a no? Is, it, is that typically something that is? I mean, normally, uh, client to client does he have that conversation? Is that something that I, as a realtor, would then my client would give it to me? I'd give it to you. You give it to me. <laughs> yeah, you could you could you can help facilitate it. Okay. So I would send over to the other list agent or the list agent, hey, my buyers want the couch, this, that, that, that. They're willing to offer this price. Is yeah. that included in the loan? No. no. They have to pay it on the side. That has to be outside of escrow. Because that guy yeah, wants to sell they, his table, right? And he wants six thousand for the table. Right. Get sold outside. It's either part of the deal. It's, it cannot be part of the loan. Right. Because okay. they aren't going to come appraising it. They aren't going to come That's appraise right. the table. That makes sense. You know. Right. So. Right. But the fixture, the, he also has fixed furniture, attached furniture. That's going to be included in the appraisal, right? Yeah. If, if you have built-in cabinets, yeah. Stuff, yeah, you yeah. can't rip those out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. But he has, uh, if you have a chandelier you want to keep, tell your seller to change out the chandelier before someone sees it. Okay. Or it needs to be noted That's in the right. MLS, not included. So what we're doing, put a, uh, you must have Five garbage bags to get there. They looped over it and had this big yeah, thing yeah. out that not included. <laughs> right. <laughs> you couldn't see it. It was like this black orb yeah. hanging in space that not included. Right. Because they, 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 they couldn't get it down. Now, 
here's one thing to note. If it says, so let's just take a look. I hate that pops up because I can't get my tabs. So here I put the table not included. But right. So if we look at this prices. listing, we can see what's included here. Washer dryer no. not included. Wow. But I thought the washer and dryer, it's like basic. Every no. home has to. The only thing 20 that, years ago, I it, think it, it was like that. Okay. The only thing required in a home on an FHA is a stove. Mm -hmm. So if the house does not have a stove and you're writing an FHA buyer, the house has to include that. Now, but if I put in here, and I type that in there, I'm asking for the washer and dryer. Even though they say it's not included in the MLS, I can type it in there. Now, if the sellers sign this, they owe me a washer and dryer. Right. Oh my God! So they have yeah. to make sure they read the just be, just because you put it yeah. as not included Those in the MLS, way. and they put it in here. This is a contract that oversees what you put in the MLS. Mm -hmm. So you need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. I saw one where they have stainless steel, and in the garage, it was stainless steel refrigerator, and the house was stainless steel refrigerator. Mm -hmm. They swapped and took the one from the house. Yes. Took the one from the garage because all it said was refrigerator. Right. So you need to be specific oh, in that. So if, it's a right. better bridge, <laughs> right? So if you're so if you're a listing agent, you better read this section and see what's it what they're asking for. You need to look for it if you're the listing agent. Um if I'm a buyer's agent and I slip that in there, guess what? They, and if I put GE or whatever model and specific on that. They have to buy that. Well, they have to leave it they or have they have to, have to buy new one. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Right. So I'm just saying you can just because they say washer and dryer is not included in the MLS is one in the house. If your buyer says, I need a washer and dryer, I want the ones in there. Right. You can add it into the yeah. contract. They may counter it out, mm -hmm. but if they don't, then so should we be specific on what type of washer dryer or just washer dryer? I think that goes a little too far. You can say new. Well, you can't make them go buy you a new you one. Can't really go buy you. No? No. Damn, I have a good imagination. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can just put Why existing not? washer and dryer. Yeah, put existing, though. Right. Have to find so I cannot make them buy a brand new one? No. Yeah. So next we get to opening a basket. Now, there's a lot of different things. Um, you'll see the MLS, escrow opened, or paperwork started with so-and-so, this title company. That's great because we all know, technically, we're not supposed to steer your people towards an escrow company. So technically, you're not even supposed to put that in the MLS, even though everyone still does. Oh. Um, no matter what it is, always, always, always the buyer's choice of escrow. If you're going to suggest one, you can suggest like, hey, you're more than welcome. I always tell my buyers, the escrow company I normally use is this. There's also several title companies you can use. You're more than welcome. They have different rates. Feel free to check them out. <coughs> Do you have a preference? Yeah, Most of the time they'll be like, well, go with who you work with. Okay, just want to make sure. So, in a lot of cases, if you are working, obviously we have escrow reps come in our office, you know, with Tim Sands, uh, Chanel. Who's Tim Sands? He's the first American title. So he's, he's another title rep. But if they're helping you, it would be nice. Like if you, like if Chanel's giving you all kinds of things and you get the buyer from this or whatever, then you go open escrow at first American. No. Not saying you they can't do it. They try showing homes and then they go buy with someone else. Right, exact same thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> and, and, and trust me, they can see who you open escrow with. Oh, yeah. Every escrow officer, they know how many escrows your company gives them, who gives them what, and all that. So, mm -hmm. right. So, like for me, I work, um, I work with different people at First American and also WFG. Um, I usually use WFG. We know. Just because I have a 
Mighty, too much. A great working relationship to Lisa Martin. Mm -hmm. And that's the other lady that came with. Yes. Okay. Yes. If you put the seller's clothes in there, do you think that would give you more competitive edge in your offer? You it, could, it could be, but you need to make sure your buyer. your buyer understands that and it could affect their rates. You know, for the most part, title companies are pretty competitive. They all know. I mean, you look at like First American Chicago title and all these, they're actually all owned by one company. Yeah. One conglomerate owns mm -hmm. this whole series of title companies. Um, same thing with WFG. WFG owns like three other title companies too. So which one? I don't know. Don't put me on the spot like that. Just kidding. <laughs> so close of escrow. Generally, we're going to do. What does WFG stand for? Uh, I forgot what it was. Oh, no, mm -hmm. it's like uh, some other name. So close of escrow. So when you're writing or before you write an offer, it's always good to speak with your lender if you don't know. Most of us just go put in a day and say, okay, well, we're going to close on this day. Well, if you're doing a VA loan, it's taking a little bit longer in VA loans, <laughs> you might want to make that 40 days. Can your lender get it done? If you want to close in 21 days because you're trying to make a stronger offer, can your lender get it done? You put in 21 here, and your lender's like, I can't do that. Well, guess what? Well, you're asking for extension at the beginning of a new thing, and you know, you're just kind of like, great, what am I doing? So... Make sure you know what you're doing on your close of escrow date. Also, so we're October 22nd here. Generally, you're going to want to close within the first two days, two to three days of the month, or the end of the month. Also, don't forget about holidays. So like here, if we were going to close in November, well, we have Thanksgiving, they're going to be closed there. The 30th would be okay because we're still good to the first or second. So you could do that or you could do the 22nd. The reason why this affects things is it affects your prorations and how much money your buyer is going to need at the close of escrow. If you close on November 10th, well, they're going to have to pay the prorations, the taxes, the HOA fees, the 10th through the 30th. So everything of those things are prorated, trash, all these things, sewer, all those bills, now you're adding you know, basically 20 days, 21 days of prorations that they have to come in with. If you close on the 30th, now you're adding one or two days. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the prorations as far as money, so that, so basically when you go to close and they go to sign and send money, closing at the end of the month could make the difference on the deal. Saying, okay, well, you only have to come in with $1,000 as opposed to 1500 or whatever that may be. But wouldn't it be better to close, like, say, like, you submit an offer, like, mid, like, mid October? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better to close, like, mid November instead of, like, trying to do, like, a 45 day close instead of 30? You know? It, it depends. You, you could if you, if you have to, yes. I'm just saying, if you look at the numbers and the, because remember, you can always close on or before. If you read yeah. this, shall be closed on or before. Oh, yeah, true. So you can always close early, which is a benefit. Yeah. But you don't want to shortchange yourself to now where you have to ask for extensions. I'd rather close early than have to be like, hey, I need another week. Because as a selling agent, you're like, well, you guys can make it close now. Now that you know chances will go through, but your seller's going to be like, oh, my gosh, this deal's falling apart. They start freaking out. Why am I going to sign this? What happens, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, if you prepare your buyers and sellers, then they know. So the more you talk to them about how things work and this and that. Also, if you need to write an addendum to extend, make sure you write close of escrow to be on or before. If you put close of escrow to be on 12.5, you can't close on 12.4 because said you're closing on 12.5. So language when you're writing a contract or writing an addendum or a counteroff, um, how you write it can change what the terms are. So if you 
is right on. Well, guess what? It's on ID. So if you are adding for asking for an extension, you can close on the fourth now or the third, or hey, we're still good on the thirtieth. Um, IRS disclosure, obviously, um, sellers, you know, they're going to notify the IRS to sell your house, you know, proceeds and stuff like that. Buyer's due diligence is condition. You can see a lot of variations here. I use the number 12. So this due diligence period is basically the opportunity for you to find out anything you want about the property, the area, the neighborhood, inspections, anything like that. A lot of times you'll see seven days, 10 days. If you make it seven, that can make your offer a little stronger saying you're going to get it done. But you write seven, better make sure your home inspector has available. Board with that. Right. Because home inspectors are busy right now. Um, the reason I put 12 is because if you put 15, they're going to counter you to 10 or seven. If you put 10, they're going to leave. If you put 12, chances are they won't counter two. They won't counter two days. That just gives me two extra days. That's all it does. That's the only reason. And it's funny now because I'm starting to see 12 on more and more contracts. I've always done that. Like that was just my little okay. thing I came up with. And now I'm starting to see other people start to do it because they, I think they kind of caught on to that. But realistically, that should do diligence. You know, any time for any reason, your buyer can cancel within those amount of days for any reason and get the EMD back per the law. But one thing about earnest money is, and you always need to tell your buyers this, is you can never guarantee that their earnest money is not at risk. So you say, well, if you cancel in five days, you're going to get your earnest money back. Great. What happens if the seller doesn't sign it to release the fund? <coughs> no, by law, the law is on your buyer's side. Yes. But if your seller refuses, if the seller refuses to sign it, your buyer has to take them to mediation to get the earnest money back. So you can never guarantee your buyer is going to get their earnest money back, even though it's in due diligence. The law states right there, they get their money back. But escrow will not release that money unless all parties sign. So what happens yeah. if the seller doesn't sign and then you go to mediation? To, they go to mediation. The mediator is going to roll you in due diligence, give them his money back. Okay, so. But I'm just that. saying. He may get a seller that for some reason just wants to get paid in the butt. Yeah. Does he get a fine for that? Mm -hmm. Um, I you know, you never know of mediation, they could charge an interest, you know, but well, they should. Yeah. yeah, but I mean we have no say in that. It's basically I'm I'm just trying to get the point out there that never guarantee mm -hmm. that your buyer's earnest money is not at risk. You know, don't you don't want to scare them, you know. It's not like, oh, your money's gone, but it's just like, hey, you're seeing them. The law's on your side, it states you earn this money back. The agency is going to tell their, their seller that, like, hey, this is the law, you got to give it back to them. Mm -hmm. um, and with earnest money too, and due diligence in certain time frames, sometimes you want a release of earnest money if you're representing the seller side. If you're going to do that in your counter, you need to find out who the escrow company is and find out what they need to get that earnest money released. Because like WFG needs another form. The seller doesn't sign that form, earnest money doesn't go anywhere. So if I'm doing a counter offer, I'll find out what language the title company needs in order to release that earnest money and any forms. So I will send my counter offer first saying that buyer must agree to these terms and sign this now and sign a task form before we accept your offer. Because now that form to release the earnest money after due diligence, so on day 13 or day 14, I want that earnest money, they agreed to release it because of whatever the terms, you know, to get this house. <laughs> if you're willing to release that earnest money, could be a benefit to get you the deal. Uh, just depends on where your buyer is. But those are some of the negotiating things in there. So, so WFG needs a form. So in order to release earnest money, they need buyer and seller to sign their own personal right. form. Okay. So if I'm a selling agent and they're agreeing to release their earnest money, in my counter offer, 
I am saying you must also sign the attached WFG form to release the earnest money on day 14 unconditional. Because what happens is if they sign the counter offer saying, hey, we'll release the earnest money on day 14, you get to day 14 and now the seller says, I'm not signing that. What are you going to do? But if the form's already signed, WFG can just send the money to your, to your seller. So in other words, you're not waiting. You're just overcoming. That's where you can get tripped up by stating that if they need a separate form signed. Well, 14 days later, if the seller changes your mind and doesn't want to sign it, what are you going to do? Yeah. So, uh, property inspections conditions. That's where you have your property inspector. Um, that's where you find out everything, you know. And ins home inspectors are always going to miss things. Every home inspector is different. The reports are different and how they look. Um, but your due diligence is because everyone's like, I need to extend my due diligence. I need to extend my due diligence. If you've done your inspections on that, do you really need to extend your due diligence? Because it's all you're doing is that's what due diligence is for. Is I mean, if your buyers like your buyers like I want to get out and get them extended, well, I guess you got to try. But people get confused on what due diligence is. That's just your chance to find out everything about the property. That's what due diligence is. It's not a cancel. It is a cancellation clause, but that's not what it's designed for. So. So when do you get the sellers? Um, what is that thing called? Sellers. Yeah, sellers disclosure form. When? What period? Between the diligence period. The SRPD. Yeah. By law, that's when you should get the SRPD. Is right after, and I would request that as a buyer's agent, I'm going to request all the disclosures. That's part of my current <coughs> contract. I want the SRPD even before I get my inspection done, mm -hmm. because I may want my inspector to look at something a little closer. Right. Like, hey, in the kitchen, they had a water leak before this, and they fixed it. Can you just double check that mm -hmm. area, you know, and to do that? Now, by law, they don't have to give you the SRPD until 10 days prior to close the escrow. Mm -hmm. That's by law. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy. So, I mean, looking at that, but yeah. that still gives you a chance to back out then, no? No, if you pass your due diligence and all that. Right. But then so how it, does that make sense? It doesn't. It doesn't. It's written by attorneys for attorneys. Yes. But yeah, by law, 10 days prior to close the escrow, they have to give you the SRPD. Yeah, they have to add it to you by then. But as an agent, being like, if you don't get it to me as a buyer's agent, I'd be like, we got to pull out then because you're not getting your. You know, I, I know what the law states, I but I need to know. What happened to that girl then that I told you about from the gym? So she's trying to buy this property at Queens Ridge. Mm -hmm. She didn't know that there was um, a problem on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, she requested the seller's disclosure, you know, and she requested, you know, and they pushed it and pushed it out. She went out of due diligence. And now she's about to lose it. She said, I'm just rather let the earnest money go because she said there's something wrong with the floor it's sticking out and they don't want to fix it they want to offer me a thousand dollars and i don't know what's going on there yeah and the inspector didn't pick it up and she had her inspection I, that's what i'm wondering too yeah that's weird yeah it's hard to say yeah <laughs> yeah and, uh, and under your srpd you have that you also have um i just told totally you can you sue the inspector <laughs> no you know, usually sign something saying that, yeah, it's just a mm -hmm. But I mean, that's where that's where you get your request for repairs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of it is your request for repairs. Um, you see a lot of things, and I, I guess it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to me the way they write it. Um, you're seeing a lot of contracts now that due diligence is extended one day for each day that the seller doesn't respond to the request for repairs. You see that in a lot of contracts now. Um, I don't like the way that's written because you give it to me on day one, you at least got to give me a two-day period. You're not going to automatically extend due diligence. Like I wouldn't, like <clears throat> as a seller, I wouldn't automatically because you gave it to me on Thursday. That starts on Friday and Saturday, but I can't meet my clients till Saturday. I'm not just going to automatically extend due diligence another two days. 
I, you know, I think a smart agent would write after two days for each additional day. That would make more sense. Um, that would that would make the offer stronger to me as opposed to I'm just going to extend due diligence for every day. You don't you don't get it, and I send it to you at ten in the morning, and you know, because a lot of agents forget how to count days too. Um, so what did you? I I I, I lost. I lost. What did we what were we talking about to write on the second day? No, I think it's, it's, oh, days are just regular really calendar days. Calendar days. Depending, you have to look at the due diligence. Yeah, I was have to refer back to that place in the contract. So. Well, what, what would you write on the second day? Extension? Or what were you referring to? I was referring to the request for repairs. Oh, request for repairs. You would write it on the second day after. No, they they write a clause in there saying due diligence to be extended if we a day for each day that the seller doesn't respond to the request for repairs. So in other words, I'm the buyer's agent. I send you the request for repairs. Uh, the next day you didn't respond, or well, my due diligence automatically extends another day, mm -hmm. which that I don't like sense. that clause in there. I would, I would change that out. I would counter that as a selling. Um, buyer's right to cancel, resolve objections, basically. Um, you know, you have your due diligence um, in that period. Um, failure to do so. Um, everything reverts back to section seven. Um, your buyers initial that um, that basically you know where they can cancel when they can cancel and whatnot. So that deals with inspections. So in inspections, we're going to look at we have all these different things. So energy audits, most things we're going to waive, not applicable, or for this. So in most cases, what we're going to do is um, since this is an FHA loan. The buyer has to have a termite inspection. If there's not a septic system, it's NA. Otherwise, we're going to do waived for most things. Because we waive things does not mean we cannot do them later. Oh, I think maybe that's VA. VA yeah. yeah, VA has to. Uh, well, inspection NA. NA, we're burning. NA, let's just say, didn't have one. NA, structural aid. And once again, blanks. I just put NA because I don't want to leave a blank and blank that wasn't addressed. So in most cases, so actually, the second case, we can just waive that. So what happens is, is you know, you, you'll see as is in a, in, in a MLS sheet, household as is. As is is, as is till I request something to be repaired. Right, exactly. As is the house being accepted as is means nothing. So I have a home inspection, I ask you to fix things. You say no, sold as is, okay, I can cancel. Or you can give me credit towards closing costs, whatever it may be. That's why on anything like this, say we say we're going to do a mechanical inspection, you put buyer, where your lender gets a copy of the purchase agreement. And the underwriter looks at it and says, where's my mechanical inspection? If you put buyer in there, then they can make you supply a mechanical inspection. What's a mechanical inspection? The mechanics of the electrical and everything in the house, the mechanics of the house. Yeah. If we have it waived, our home inspector picks up something, we can always look at it then. If there's a problem with the roof, we can come out and have a roof inspection. We have the opportunity to do that. So. And we don't have to put um, no depreciation on you know, the outcome of the inspection. No, because that's already actually written into the request for repairs in, in the contract here. <coughs> Okay. You have the opportunity, if anything is found, you have the opportunity to, to request further inspection. And that's why and that's why we are waiving these things, because if we need to do further inspections, we will. If there's a problem with the pool, hey, now we're going to have a pool bank. But I'm not going to hire 50 guys to come inspect the house for different sections unless I need to. Yeah. So home inspectors covers pretty much in general, everything. They can look at everything. They'll make recommendations you'll see in a home inspection. Recommend further inspection, seek qualified, whatever. And I was going to refer you to 
a qualified electrician, a qualified HVAC person, a qualified plumber. Right. You know, that's the way they cover themselves as home inspectors. So when um, when an agent puts in their like in the note sells as is, um, they don't fix anything, but they would possibly get a credit for stuff. It could be, yeah. <laughs> So it depends. I mean, you take an FHA, you take an FHA, you accept an FHA offer, and inspection comes in or appraisal comes in, um, especially with an appraisal, and the appraiser makes conditions on that property, that's tied to that house for 180 days. That appraisal price is tied. So if someone else comes in with an FHA loan, guess what? That's the appraised value, and those things still have to be fixed because it's assigned a, a contract number for that appraisal for that property and they're tied together. So any other FHA offers that come into that property, if that seller's like, well, I'm not fixing anything, well, guess what? You can't take any FHA offers because that's the price you're getting and that's what you have to fix. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions on this section here? Um, certifications, that's if you need something certified. Um, sometimes you'll see an appraiser come by and be like, I want a rough certification. Um, good luck on getting one of those. It's one of the hardest things to get because most roofing companies will not certify a roof unless they repair or put a new roof on. So they'll, they'll certify their patch. Yeah. They will not certify the work that they Right. So it's very tough to get done. Um, I've gotten it done. It wasn't a certification, but I got the repair done. And I haven't got the buyer, the buyer to pay half the roof repair before they even move to the house. Wow. So, um, <coughs> escrow fees. Typically 50-50. Lender's title policy. <laughs> That's by the buyer. Right. If you have a cash offer, there is no lender's title policy. It is NA or waived. Owner's title policy, seller. Real property transfer tax, seller. Buyer appraisal, other NA. What would be a, what would be a, <coughs> I've never seen that um, no, a lot of them put like HOA docs, it may be. Um, uh, some have uh, SIDS and LIDS. If you have SIDS and LIDS, oh, okay. Um, if there is, I think, like in Sun City Anthem, they have like a one percent fee for a new buyer, um, mm -hmm. to acquire in for the HOA. Oh, wow. So, there's, there's a fee like that. <laughs> Funded, yeah. Not, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so there's different things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Real property transfer tax, just so y'all know, I believe it is still $5.10 per thousand. So this is an area that if you want to write a stronger offer, you may split that 50 50. You may offer the seller a little bit, like, hey, we'll cover some that because it's that's convenient, you know, depending on the price. The house could be a thousand dollar fee. Also, other things in here if a house is ridiculously overpriced by like 50,000 or something like that, you can put in here the seller to pay for the appraisal. Now, if you do that later in the contract on page eight or nine, you have additional terms where at what point you would write buyer to reimburse seller for appraisal. If property, you know, you know, basically, if property does not appraise and the buyer and the seller comes down to the price, you're going to reimburse them at close of escrow. Okay. At successful close of escrow. So by doing that, and you know, depending on you know that changes from market to market. Obviously, on a seller's market, it'd be kind of hard to get done right now. But some people are still a little crazy and like, oh, I'm going to price this house. At, you know, I want six hundred thousand. It's like, well, the house next door is a model match and just sold for five hundred two days ago. Yeah, but my house is better. Of course it is. Right. It's always better, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, in that case, you could, that's where you might put something like that in there that 
you know, buyer to re and reimburse seller for appraisal act successful close of escrow. Leave it at that. Don't get into fancy terms. Um, people I see in counter offers and offers, people tend to write all this. They try to write like an attorney. Don't do it. First of all, the law states that you must make your contracts legible and readable and understandable by the common person. That means someone that's not an attorney, that's not real estate, must be able to understand what you wrote clearly. So if you write all kinds of, you know, people get in there. So it's some of the stuff I've seen in contracts, you're just like, what did I like? I don't even know what they mean. Right. Yeah. Imagine me then. What? <laughs> So those are just, I mean, as far as our traditional contracts, this is the way we structure them. Uh, obviously that, you know, real property transfer tax seller and buyer. This is just stuff about title, prorations, who's paying what, preliminary title report. Lenders fees and closing fees. If your buyer is asking for closing costs, this is where you put that. Okay. Now you can either type it as a monetary unit or as a percentage. So you can put up to 4%, up to 5% on FHA now, I believe they can contribute. They just changed that. <clears throat> yeah, they just added 1%. So you could go up to 5%, which means they can use up to 5% of that. Oh, you don't put like split it 50, 50. No, this, you're asking for closing costs. Yeah. So you're asking for money from the seller. Why right? you can't split 50, 50, you can't be like, I need five grand, but I'm only going to put in 2,500. You put in 2,500. You just ask for 2,500. Okay. Yeah. So what's the five percent of the five percent of the or of, month? of the sales price? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, five percent. So you want whatever five percent of the sales price is in closing costs. How much? How many percent are the closing cost of the sales price? It depends on average. What about four, four and a half? I think on some. It, it depends, yeah. So then why would I ask for 5%? Well, you may the need, highest, right? the highest yeah, that's just the highest. highest. Yeah. Now, what do you guys think the difference between including or excluding means? In and out. I get confused. Because you, you have to check a box here, so there's, you have to put something there. So if I, so if I put, I want 5,000. Closing costs, and I'm doing an FHA loan. What would be the difference between including and excluding? Well, if you include it, um, that would be uh, in addition to. Um, what is that backwards? Five thousand dollars for the buyer to pay. That's what the including cost is. <coughs> so, if there were any other costs. This would be in addition to this cost, but if you exclude it, there's no other addition. That'd be no other addition. Right. So basically, what it means, like say in a VA loan, you have to pay for a termite inspection. Right. If I ask for five thousand dollars, and let's just say the termite inspection is a hundred dollars, if I put including, that hundred dollars comes off that five thousand. So now I get 4,900 in closing because I'm including the fees that the seller is required to pay for that loan. If I do excluding, that means they get the 5,000 and they still pay the 100 for the termite inspection. So 5,000 is whatever they have to pay for that loan plus the 5,000. So any fees required that the seller is required to pay by that loan for that loan program, if you do including, that comes off the money you were asking for. So that can be a difference. So if you check excluding, that means you want, hey, you pay what you got to pay for my loan, and I want fire. So a lot of people, you know, confuse those. So it is an important thing to know, like, hey, are you doing that? If you ask for five thousand, what you want included, it's just kind of be like, well, yeah, I know you guys got to pay some costs that comes off of that. So. Would you say it's mostly most people do including or do they exclude? It, it depends. If you're if you're if your buyer needs a hard five thousand to close, 
which we know a lot of them do, yeah. like they can't do it without that 5,000, um, then you would do excluding. Okay. Okay. So that's what I did on the last Virginia Tenderary House. We mm -hmm. made a conventional loan. And then she, when she um, she countered and then she said, what did she say? She said it's actually including. I mean, you still got the 5,000 though. So not really well, because in, in a conventional loan, there's nothing that sells required to pay. Oh, so that's why. Yeah, okay. so it doesn't so matter. Yeah, it's, it's in that in a conventional loan, it's not going to affect anything. In FHA and VA, is where yeah, like there are some right. seller fees in there. They're minimal, <laughs> a couple hundred bucks, but a couple hundred bucks is yeah. you know, that's it. Yes. Another big thing: home warranty. Obviously, in the buyer's notice of disclosure that I know we all have sign, have our buyer sign, or we'll have our buyer sign. Notice of disclosure. Yes. So disclosure form for the buyers to sign. Talks about scorpions, talks about airplane noise, talks about sure. golf course closing. Big one. And when do I do that? When you're writing an offer. Well, I didn't do that yet. Oh. Well, we're just writing the offer for that, but we'll go that later. Anyways, they want a home warranty to their buyer requires or waves. And once again, this comes into that one story I told you earlier, where the buyer said, oh no, I didn't get a home warranty. I wanted one, you told me, and I was like, well, no, we told you that that was a home inspection, but same thing with a home warranty. They think they get one, and they're like, oh, no, I didn't get one. Oh, but mine did get one. Yeah. She included it. So I don't, but that's only, you know, the notice of disclosure is only when they don't want one. Well, it's both. I mean, they still got to do the notice of disclosure. But it's just an extra place that they're initially deciding what they want. And what they want. So, <laughs> um, in this case, we can put first American home warranty, which you need to be determined. Um, obviously, with a home warranty, you want to give them an option of which company they want to use. Um, or, you know, our basic preferred one is First American that we use. Um, but some people want HWA or American Home Shield, you know, someone. The amount, um, you always want to put, the, I think the prices are 595 so maybe I go 600 not to include 600 If there's a pool, I put 800 because pool coverage is always additional. And then once again, this is going to affect your offer. Is the seller going to pay for it or is the buyer going to pay for it? The buyer wants one. Are you going to ask the seller to pay for it? What do you suggest? It depends on the price. Yeah. Um, it depends on the it depends on the price. It depends on the market. Condition of the house. Yeah, there's. Yeah. Right. We want you to pay for that. Yeah, it depends. I mean, if you're dealing with a house with multiple offers, that's going to change. How bad does your buyer want the house? Okay, so let me ask you something. So everybody no. who looks at the Spanish Shield <laughs> is telling about the AC units, right? So can I tell them or just get a home protection plan and they cover it? No, you cannot. You can you can, you can be like, if you want, you can get a home warranty, but you can't say they're going to cover it because any home warranty company is going to be like, oh, is that already there? Was that a pre-existing yeah, problem? Yeah, absolutely. It's 1997, right? Right, I'm just saying. 96. But, but now you just guarantee that the home warranty company is going to fix it. Oh, okay. And if they don't, guess what? So they not. She's buying them a new AC unit for fifteen thousand dollars. Oh my goodness, three so, of them. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah there's two. fifteen thousand dollars each. Ten to fifteen. Yeah. Depending on the size of the house. Yeah. Well, we no, no wonder nobody buying that home. <laughs> they out. You know, they go straight. Right. Yeah. Okay. HOA stuff. CIC demand. Who pays for that? Seller. Normally put in there. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people type in HOA resale package. Seller, well, seller by law has to pay for HOA resale package. Technically, the demand though can be paid by someone else. The capital contribution is that one percent. Um, in those additional fees that we're talking about earlier. All right, McKinley. <laughs> um, disclosures. I always, re I always request that 
always request an SRPD. Um, in some offers you see come over, they don't put SRPD on there because it's required by law. And some lenders will be like, well, give us the SRPD. So if they don't request the amount required by law, then the lender's like, oh, do they get it? You know? <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Is this his birthday? No. Oh. <laughs> Where's the champagne? So I always do SRPD construction defects. Um, obviously, lead based paint, if the house is built in 1978 or prior, or before 1978, it's a 77 and earlier. Um, <coughs> open range, that's going to be if you're right, way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so can, back, can, can you be backed up against um, like uh, Bureau of Land Management? You could be backed up against BLM. Uh, most of it's going to be where, like in Pahrump, where they have like some cattle farms and stuff like that over the mm -hmm. range. That would be like if when the people are moving to Las Vegas, right? I don't know. Um, that it may Hopefully, it was free range. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Not, like, open range. Oh, no, right. Section 10 from the middle of the city. Open range has to be really open. Yeah. <laughs> um, other, I've never checked other. Um, if there's something else you want, I guess. Um, but you cannot put a time that, why can't you just put a time there too? Like, I would like it in uh, within the next four days. I, I guess you could. Well, this is a list of other disclosures you want. Right, but you said you know they don't have to put it under. But see, by checking this, seller within five calendar days of acceptance, seller will provide the following disclosures and or documents. So now he has to give it to you. Right. So when we're talking about the SRP, if you don't check it, they can wait till ten days prior to close to get it. Okay, to you. so that's if the it catch. is checked and they agree to this and don't counter it out, now they got to do it within five days. So then that offsets that whole right extending the. Um, the Disclosure, I mean, due diligence. Did you check this box? Um, I think it's for the SRPD. Right. You know, you oh, should. Oh, understood. Yeah. Because the extension is more on the request for repairs. So, walk through. I always do, you can do one to two. The reason why you want to go as close to close of escrow as possible is because once you sign your loan docs, it records that's your house. You don't get your keys till it records. So they have confirmation from the county recorder. You cannot get the keys to the house as a buyer. So if you did your walkthrough seven days prior and you didn't go back to that property, let's just say there was flood damage, some kids broke in, whatever it may be, Guess what? You're stuck with it. It's your mm -hmm. house now. So by doing it close to the close of escrow, the day you're signing, the day before, some one or two days, you're reducing your chances of something happening. I'm not saying something can happen, but I can tell you we have had it happen in our office before with an agent. That's quarter. They did their walkthrough seven days prior. Well, some people broke in and spray painted all the walls and graffiti mm -hmm. everywhere and Guess who didn't get a commission? Had to give up their commission to correct all the damages. Wow. Well, no, typically when does your What's that uh, homeowner's policy kick in? Uh, as soon as you get the keys or? Yeah, you... yeah, normally your homeowner's policy takes over at that point because okay. you don't own the home until you're recorded. Mm -hmm. Right. So would wow. that fall on the seller's homeowner's or no? It doesn't. No, because at that point you aren't noticing you until off that you signed off on the property. You did your walkthrough. Okay, you can have uh, insurance, right? Yeah. Like the rent. rental insurance, right? No, because you're not renting it either. Yeah, right, but do they have something orders. similar to a home? No. But they already signed, like you said, because we did a You already signed off a walkthrough that you accept the house. So. Um, what about if you have a squatter in there? You're screwed. Well, you should, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, wait, wait, wait. What if there is a squatter in there that does that prior to your walkthrough? Who then takes care of that? You so, so if you do your walkthrough one, 
one day prior uh -huh. that there's a squatter in there. Yeah. I'm not signing so the loan. Like, you have that two days and somebody does it within those two days. Then you're going to have to evict that squatter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Luckily, Metro is faster with it now. They actually have the forms because of what happened in oh, 2007, 8, you know, Thank with all the evictions and squatters with all these vacant homes. Do you think that's going to happen? No. no. What do you mean they have the papers? When I called uh, the metro on a squatter, my best friend's house was empty and uh, somebody moved in there who I kicked out. <laughs> Were you a realtor Don't... at the time? Did you fill no. out the form that's in MLS? No. Okay. <laughs> well, I told him I don't want to take care of his property, but you know right. how friends are. Right. This and you, and you can't kick a squatter. Really Metro came, he said he can't kick him out because he has a rental agreement. He made himself, he was a right. smart guy. And I said, who is it anyway? And then I saw him, I'm like, I just kicked him out of my house. He stole the keys to this property. He's like, oh, okay, well, let's take him to jail. <coughs> <coughs> so that's why walk through, oh, we do things like that. Um, deliver in possession, close of escrow. Um, in a case with the lease back, um, you can put lease back 30 days, something in there, you know, different things. Um, default mediation, um, buyers and sellers sign this. They don't have to agree to mediate, just so you know, there's some sellers that won't sign this, there's some buyers that won't sign it. Because it's there doesn't mean they have to meet, agree to mediate, just mm -hmm. so you know. This is just saying if they initial this, they agree to mediate if there's a problem before basically hiring lawyers. Do, do we agree or what do we, sorry, go ahead. Do they initial or do you put in a, if they don't want initial? If they don't initial, it's blank. That's blank. Yeah. But do we give them the, oh, what do we do? I'm, I'm normally there, they just initial it. If they want to. Right, but if they don't want to initial it, they're gonna call you and be like, I'm not initialing that, then you gotta take it out and reset it to them. Okay. Well, then you gotta redo it. Right, you gotta essentially set it in. Right, okay. yeah. A seller defaults for performance. You can actually seal them for a specific performance. There's very few ways a seller can get out on the same contract. He can? Cannot get out. Uh, broker's compensation. This is the doc fee. So this is the buyer will pay. If you're paying it, you can put not pay. I'm not paying. And obviously, waiver of claims, definitions, acceptance with his name, legally binding contract, um, essential terms. Additional addendums attached. This is where you would write um, post possession addendum, short sale addendum What's to purchase. Oh. That they're going to stay in the house after it closes. So, if there's another addendum, that goes along with his purchase agreement, uh, contingent upon sale addendum. That's where you write where these addendums are in here. Additional terms, if there's any additional terms. Um, sometimes you'll see washer dryer to stay in this section as well. They won't put it on the fixture section, but put it in here. So you can put it in different places. Also, you can put in here, buyer to reimburse seller for appraisal upon close of escrow. Also, make sure this stuff is filled out. The more complete you can make it, the better your offer looks to me, something I look for. Um, licensee disclosure. Do you have an interest? Are you related to the buyer? Anyway, if in doubt, disclose. Um, I always disclose. Um, if it's a friend, no, right? Only if it's a family. If it's family, yes. If it's a niece, nephew, something like family, something like that. Or if you're somehow buying, putting down payment in it, whatever. Um, For me, as far as times uh, that they respond by, depending on what's going on with the property, um, I always read agent to agent remarks. Some of them say buyer's out of town or seller's out of town or seller difficult to get a hold of, please allow two days. 
they put that in there, don't give them a day. If they put, hey, we need three days, why would you put a day in there? You know, let's just be, let's be smart about how we write contracts. You know, pay attention, look to agent to agent remarks, things like that. Um, other additional terms, uh, contingencies. Um, a lot of these homes that are occupied by tenants. Can't go show tenant occupied property still. Uh, I believe still, you still cannot, even though they, because they can evict them now. Wait. Is it, is it, I thought we could. I thought we could. You might be able to, but it may it still may be difficult. <laughs> but, Oops. but. They gave him 24 hour notice. Yeah. 48 yeah. to 24. But, he, but here's something. Okay. Your your client, this house just came on the market. It's going really fast. Your client really wants, but they're not going to be in town until the next day. But you want to get an offer in because you know there's going to be five offers on this property right away. Mm -hmm. You can write contingent upon buyer viewing property. And then buyer will release contingency upon, um, upon viewing property. So I can write this offer, get it in, get it signed, and get my offer accepted without my buyer seeing the property yet. Now, if no, the buyer's never going to see that back to the previous under, under, under additional terms. Additional terms. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So those are different things in there you okay. can put in there. Contingent upon buyers and property. Um, there's all kinds of additional things you can do that you may need to do. But that's a way if you need to get an offer in right away, but you can't, you know, hey, I work. I can't go see until Saturday. Well, you know, this house is going to be in contract by Thursday. You know, put it in there. You know, if, if they run away. They may. You make but a good, if somebody else makes an offer and they like it. What if I offer them 20 grand more? You think they might wait for my offer to let me see the property? Or now you know they're entertaining the offer now that can change the terms of the short check on the point in front of the house. Right. Yeah. It just yeah. gives you that opportunity. Right. Other things. Buyer to pay five thousand dollars above appraisal, up to sales price. Additional, additional terms. Mm -hmm. So these are different areas where you can make your offer stronger. Um, lease back terms, see lease back terms. Um, you know, who pays what fees, what terms you put in there. These are all different things that you can put under additional terms. Um, also, this is the pet peeve of mine. This never fills in here, this section. So I'll show you a little secret. Hopefully you're still logged in. If you click on the MLS, if you click the agency's name, it'll always give you the broker's name and broker's license number. Oops, what's one more? Yeah. So you can fill out the broker's name and license number in there, a PDF that's signed that's a secure document over the other agent. It's hard for them to go in and type on that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So for me, people that fill that out, actually, on my half, probably get a little more attention. Right. You know, because I'm like, you're taking the time to do that. To make my life a little better. Right. right. You're, just make, you're just making it. Obviously, we can't. Um, obviously, we can't, you know, check if they have an interest or not. Um, sell our stuff. And then, obviously, they're going to accept it, counter or reject it. Now, this is one thing I always go over with my buyers. So, these are the options. So, we're going to submit the offer. The seller has the option to accept our offer as is. They can counter it, change some of the terms, change some of the things, and those two things will become part of the offer. So when you get a counter offer, it becomes, and you accept it, it's the offer and the counter offer are now one document. The counter offer succeeds or replaces whatever section they counter. So if it's reference to a section, earnest money, whatever it is, that counter offer supersedes. Once you're in contract, 
and it's accepted, then everything from there on out is addendums. And addendums are number one, two, three, four, stay going on. If addendum is not accepted because there's no rejection place on an addendum, you send an addendum over to someone, they don't sign it, but you do another addendum, you're still at addendum one. Because the first addendum one you sent over was never ratified. Right. So if they sign it, then you go to addendum two if you need to. But otherwise, it's addendum one. Because otherwise, you're screwing up the order because I'm going to look and be like, oh, you have addendum two, where's addendum one? Well, they never signed it. Oh, okay. So they're, you know, it's just out of sequence. That is all. Well, that's basically, you know, a couple things. And then let me share a different screen here. Um, I just want to show you guys a few different offers here. So this is actually offers that I received, uh, a listing I had that I'm going to ask about. And just kind of want to see what you guys think about how they wrote them. See if you guys pick up anything. Stuff I highlight on them is just I highlight for the purpose of the, the seller, just to see, you know, like things I'm just looking at, like here's the offer price. So in this case, they're offering $3,000 EMD. That was in there. What's that? That was the purchase price? No. These are offers that oh, weren't cool. accepted. So these are offers on the Lucena Washburn that I have. So they're offering 292 777. That's a freaking number. <laughs> yeah. Where would they come up with that? So they're getting a loan for 278 mm -hmm. conventional. You can see blanks in here. Oh, God. You can see blanks in here. Doing conventional loan, balance of purchase price. I was looking to see what they're putting down total. So we're looking at the terms. New loan application, five days. Appraisal 21, loan 30. Now, in my case, my seller, they're buying a new home. They need to sell this home in order to buy this new home, which they aren't going to need the money till mid-November. Oh, well, new construction. Home? New construction. But we still wanted to get this for the loan purpose with the new home construction. We just wanted to have the cash available because they're putting a large amount of cash down. So in this case, you know, for something I want to close quick, do I want to wait 30 days? So I bring that up to the buyer. Do I want to wait 30 days for, can they get the loan and find out they can't? Because now I got to put the house back in the market. And if I am closing, you know, that would put me into September. Right. Then I find out now I got to put the house back in the market, try to get another escrow now at the end of yeah. October. Yeah. Right. So those are things that I take into consideration when presenting. Um, not contingent. Um, this is part of the new con. Oh, this is part of the new contract too. I don't know. Smart devices. Um, WGN International Title. I don't know who that is. Close of escrow. Yeah, when do they want to close by? That's important to look. Due diligence. So buyers paying for their stuff, waived everything else, uh, roof inspection. Who's paying different things. Those are just things I always highlight. But now I get to here. They want seven thousand dollars in closing costs. They offer me two ninety two minus seven. That brings me back down. So essentially, my buyer's gonna, my seller's gonna net seven thousand dollars less. We aren't gonna get two ninety two. We're gonna get two eighty five. And they want a home warranty for nine fifty. So that brings me down another thousand dollars. So that's affecting the bottom that of my sellers, what they're going to get. Um, I love it when they do this, CIC demand. There is no CIC on this property. There's no HOA. It should be LNA. 
So I like for me, I look at those things. I want to know how confident the other side I'm dealing with is. So the clean when the, we talk about clean offers, these are different things that we see. Are you paying attention? These are things that I look at to represent. That's just how I do it. Other agents don't care, but I'm OCD on this kind of stuff. So um, these are just different things I look at. What are they looking for? Construction defects, delivery and possession, close of escrow. Um, then I want to look and see, do they have additional terms in here? Oh, they do. Um, buyer allow seller to rent back uh, through end of October. Contention upon uh, between buyer and seller agreement. So we don't know what that agreement is yet, how much they want. Uh, buyer to pay uh, office, okay, let me do. And then I think it says, uh, in the event appraisal comes in lower than asking price, the buyer and seller uh, are unable to negotiate a new acceptance. Cancellation the seller shall reimburse the buyer. So if it doesn't appraise and my seller doesn't agree, they're saying now my seller has to pay for the appraisal. Wow. So obviously we didn't take this offer. <laughs> Well, you told us to do the same out. thing if it's overpriced, but that wasn't overpriced. Right, but I, I asked the seller to pay up front. They're saying if it doesn't appraise, then my seller, so they're saying we'll pay for the appraisal, but if it doesn't appraise, we don't agree now, now the okay. seller's going to pay for it. So they reversed it. <laughs> they should have just asked my seller to pay for it up front, and they'll reimburse me close the escrow. If it oh, I see. They did it backwards. So here's another offer. Let's look at this one. So 290,000. So this one uh, to be picked up by escrow holder. Uh, no days. They don't say when they're going to do it. So that would default to one business day that technically, but still. So this one's kind of interesting. We're doing 3,000 earnest money. We're financing $252,000. We're putting a balance of purchase price for fifty-five thousand dollars for a total purchase price of two ninety. Unfortunately, their numbers add up to three hundred ten thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of like one of those things that, like, okay, not not great. Like, I'm like, who am I dealing? With? Right, yeah. As a selling agent. So now at that point, do you redo the contract, the, the whole document, or do you? If I wrote out? this, I'd redo it. If I did the error, I'd be like, "Yeah, I'll send you a new one." Like but for them. For okay. them, just okay. reject their offer. They can't. Oh. They can't even run it off the property. I got 19 yeah. offers on this property. You can't do it right. Do I want to work with you? No. Okay. So you'd yeah, be like, check by right. by. Yeah. Gotcha. Here's the last one: two ninety-two, three thousand. This was actually sent to me. Wow. <laughs> kind of missing. A lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. Do I really know they're doing a conventional loan? I don't even know how much they're financing. Technically, you know, just kind of, you know, can't can't fill it out properly. It's just, you know, these are things. Unfortunately, and I got a lot of these. By the way, I got a lot of different ones that are just like, you know, you wonder out there, and that's why. When you hear us kind of get on you, it's because we want to be better. Right? Yeah. We want it. We want to do it right. I can fill out a purchase agreement in probably five minutes, and within ten minutes, I can have it sent up for e-signatures. For what? For e-signatures. Oh. And out to the client. You know, because if you know what you're talking about, and you right, know, and, right. and you ask, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want a home warranty? Do you want this? You should be able to. You should be able to get them off of it now. In 15 minutes at the latest, because you're just filling in numbers. If you know and write down appraisals, the biggest things you got to know are your appraisal contingency, your loan contingency, and your due diligence. You know when you're closing. 314 right? <coughs> Yeah. Uh, no. Well, appraisal is 14, loan would be 21. Oh, no. So here they have 14 and 18. So oh. that's a little bit stronger. Like 
to me, that's a little more appealing, even though they screwed up the first page. Um, 9.30, the closing at the end of the month. These offers were being accepted in the middle of August when we were doing this. So now you're doing 45 days. Once again, that pushes my seller's timeline. So I, if I was going to consider the software counter, I would tighten up that closing estimate. Mm -hmm. um, indefinite due diligence. I don't think. You know, that's. So when he leaves the blind, then. Yeah, I kind of need a number there, but that, that would be counted out. Don't they double check you? Like, looking for a broker, is a broker yeah. or whoever? Well, they don't. Like, when you guys write an offer, you're out there. I'm, you know, you write an offer Saturday night on a property you just showed, you're sending it off. You know, you're going to sign and send it off. We don't review it first. I want you to review it. I, I mean, yeah, you, can, sure. you can ask us to review it. We will, but we aren't just going to automatically. No, you know. I would. But what company is this guy working for? Uh, Andrea. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a bias. So this all blank. No. Now here's now here's the problem. We're like, well, you only asked for a home inspection. You didn't ask for a seller inspection. Well, you take this in a court and be like, well, we didn't not ask for one either. Right. It's blank. It's not clarified. That's why we don't leave blank because it's subject to interpretation now. What? What? I I assume we didn't want a pool inspection. You assumed I can still get one. I just didn't answer the question of who's paying for it. So now the court will say what? Well, I can be like, no, I want you to pay for the pool inspection. See, now it's, a, it's subject to interpretation. Okay. Because there's nothing answered. There's nothing to find who's paying for what. Whether you waive it, whether you're going to do it or not. So these are just different things like you know, lender's title policy, buyer owners, okay, transfer tax, appraisal buyer. Um, zero, so we stated that it requires 500 buyer pay for it. We stated any there that we're looking. Uh, after upon agreed time, upon agreed time afterwards. Victor. Like he didn't even fill out his own broker's license. Oh you know, Victor. like, what the heck? Yeah, I just kind of, no, obviously none of my stuff's filled out either. But, oh. You know. And then obviously we responded, rejected it, but I had to put in this that I do have a relationship, you know, with my niece's husband. Um, but just to give you an idea of what's out there. Mm -hmm. You know, these are different things that can kill an off. That's why I just want to, you know, double check. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. lots of places where you can Make things now. I can tell you the offer I, we did accept on this house. They paid up to twenty thousand over appraised value. They paid my seller's closing costs, <laughs> which is rare. And they also did a lease back to November fifteenth with no charge. Wow, it's crazy, huh? Yeah. Wow. Is California like? No. no. Say, I mean, I, and, and, and this, you know, square foot ranch for what's the, 800,000 <laughs> bucks. Who cares? What's the address of that property? I'm going to see what that property is. I know. This but was an FHA crazy. loan. Now, the reason also they were putting $90,000 down on the FHA loan, which is unusual. Right. It was 3.5%. That probably could have changed our mind a little bit because you're going to put 3.5% down. Yeah. You don't really have you know much in there. They're putting 90000 down. They're paying 20000 up to 20000 over appraisal up to offer price. They mm -hmm. offered us 313. This agent had shown the house in February when we had it listed at 240. We had to take it off the market because they couldn't find another property. Then we raised it up to 280 because that's what the comps were and I was at the high end of the comps. I took FHA and VA out because I had, last time I had it at 240, we had 30 offers. 
but we kind of got tired of saying rejections. So I still had 19 offers on this property. So this agent showed it now and she asked like, where are you at? My buyer's got to have this property. I said, well, I'm above asking price. What's important is price, willing to pay over appraisal and lease back terms. And her buyers came and said, this is what we want. We want this house. What's what, that? Kids live next door or something? I no. mean, that's, that's what we do. Uh, wow. Washburn, 221 Washburn. 6221 girl. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so that's what it was. They, they offered 313, $90,000 on FHA. Wow. And the appraisal came in at 294. Believe it or not. Now, the so appraised your comps were yes, but also the appraiser contacted me because oh. the appraiser said, You had it oh, 240 at 280 now. Where do you get your number? Mm. Said, Well, there's a house down the street that's literally 90 square feet bigger that goes to 282.5 already that doesn't have nearly the backyard. Same condition inside, good condition, but not nearly the backyard. It's a pool and just rock. Just rock around the pool, nothing, just plain, like mm, blank backyard with a hole in the ground of water. And she knew, the appraiser knew that, okay, well, we're at 313. She's like, I can't give you that. That doesn't make sense. So she kind of like split the medium, knowing, like, well, I don't want to piss off the buyer, I don't want to piss off the seller. So she gave me 294 because she knew where the offer was. I need to work with that appraiser. Right. Well, well you I'm never know the appraiser you're going to get. Yeah, you never know. But I was lucky because she, I was lucky because she did contact me. Oh, well, so I gave I her. Go on the so I gave her my reasoning. I mean, yeah, that, that appraiser friend. <laughs> right. So that's how I got the 294 appraisal because I spoke with her and she understood where I was coming from. And I said, right. I got 19 offers in this house. She's like, I get where you're coming from. So we got the 313. They paid 19,000 over appraisal, and we closed. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. So you, you add 33000 over asking price. You add closing cost of $5,000. And you add two months rent in there. You're a genius. Yeah. 40 grand basically <laughs> over, over asking price. Yeah. yeah, they went above and beyond. Yeah. This, the agent was like, I can't even believe I'm sending you this offer. Like, I've never done anything like this in my life. You know, she's like, I can't even believe but it. But it was dictated by your buyers. Right. But she hit all the marks. Oh, yeah. Bang, oh, bang, bang. Well, she oh, called you to find oh, out what was important. Right, but so, so did everyone else. But everyone else is coming in at 290. They're like, oh, we'll do a rent back at 1500 a month. I said, hey, our rent back terms are important. Paying over appraised value is important because we, I, I know where the comps are. I'm not lying. You know, I know where I price it. I was at 280, I was at the top end of the comps. I didn't expect them to go there with it. Right. But so, once they did, then it was, you know, we reviewed every offer and it's kind of yeah, like, kind of hard nope. to turn down. Nope. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that that's like, that's like the golden egg offer. Like, right. You know, exactly. you know, but it was just, I communicated with the agent. I didn't say what my highest offer was. I said, mm -hmm. I can tell you, I'm above list. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. above list, you know. So I kind of gave her the indication and they're like, we got to have it. So they're like, what do you think we should do? You know, they had already gotten blown out on six other properties. Yeah, they couldn't were, get them. Oh, wow. That was part of the deal thing too. That the buyers got, the, the buyers wow. had gotten blown out on six other properties. And they're like, done, no, throw no. it down, just give it to us. Wow. So there we go. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But, you know, that's it. I mean, contracts okay, always. This wasn't a courtesy list. No. I put a lot of I put a lot of work into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the things we do for family. But you know that's that that's basically it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can structure contracts, and that's why I think they're important because you know how you need to know how to write them, where you can put in additional terms, and also what you look for. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of offers here asking for a new, the kitchen table and a new uh, cabinet or whatever they put under the TV, which my niece has literally just bought a week before. Mm 
-hmm. She's like, I'm not getting out of the sale. I just, I just bought that. Why would I want to give that up? You know? mm -hmm. But if you don't look for those things and overlook them, you can, you can get yeah. burned. You get burned. So it's always key to look at, you know, what people are writing and, mm -hmm. and also what you're writing. You know what you can write. And how to ask for a different level. I'm going to have to look at my before. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're good at seeing, like, the different angles. Like, you're really good at getting creative with that. Yeah, and, and that's it. It's kind of how you word things. And I think as a new agent, you don't really think of that because you're just trying to, like, check all the boxes. You're trying to check all the boxes, oh, yeah. you know, but you yeah, tend you, you tend wrong, to overthink but... things too. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. being simpler is better mm -hmm. because yeah. it makes it clear. When you start trying to write all this bumbo jumbo in there, now I've got to counter you out. I've got to clean up the language you wrote in there to make sure. You know, now you're making more work for me. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna, and there are times, yes, I've negotiated back and forth between saying one thing, I'm like we're on our fourth, we're on our fourth addendum, our fourth counter. So I finally counted, and we were just like, everything was there except for like one thing. I was like, hey, if we do this, are you guys in? Before we wasted time, we go back and forth with five more counters. Let's just hash this out. What do you need? This is what we need. Can we reach an agreement? Boom, did it. Then we wrote the counter out and had it signed. This was the same deal. Not the same deal. This, no, was, this one. was a different one. Yeah. Okay. This is actually the one where I had to pay for half of the roof repair. Okay. It's a three thousand dollar roof repair, and they paid fifteen hundred for the whole even closed. Without even a guarantee of closing. Wow. So, oh, it's impressive. It is impressive. So it's right. just, you know, another case where people wanted to be in the neighborhood, they wanted the house, loved it, you know, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a great house, but the appraiser made it a condition. So it had oh. to be done. It was it was a condition, mm -hmm. had to be fixed. So I didn't want to spend all the money. And buyers like, I'll split it with you. And they're like, okay. Wow. So well, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. So thank obviously, you. Carrie, and myself, Kevin, we're always here for questions. I was here to help. But uh, you know, just realize that we always want you to try to write it first. Oh, sure. Just to see where you're at, what you're, the way you're thinking, because I think that's the way you're going to learn yeah. is oh, by reading it first, and then we can review it and be like, hey, why'd you put this? Yeah. What was your thinking? So that way we can help fix the way you're thinking about it and get it correct. So right. that'll help you become a stronger contract. Well. Yeah. You know, we have the advantage of looking at hundreds of contracts every year, thousands of them. But over the years, you know, we see counter offers, everything. We've seen it all. Right. Because Carrie and I, we get all of your contracts. Every time we write an offer, we have to review them. So that gives us, you know, a hundred times the experience. Right. So. Oh my God, I thought it was Tuesday today. Mm -hmm. Well, but thank uh, you so much. all right, yeah, so really I'm going to go ahead and end this now. Are you recording the? Um